Okay, I think we are now live. Welcome to the Radical Philosophy Hour. Um, so happy to be joined today by two uh, wonderful scholars. Before I kind of introduce them, I just want to uh, let everybody know that we are going to be continuing and we're going to be back to our regular schedule um, next week or rather next month. So look for us um, on the first Monday of the month at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, next month, I think we'll be talking about two really interesting and exciting uh, works in uh, decolonial philosophy. I believe that is what is on the schedule. So um, I really look forward to that. And uh, keep your eyes out, stay, stay aware, follow us on Facebook or you know, through our listserv for more information about that. Um, so to go ahead and get us started today, we'll be hearing from, as I said, two wonderful philosophers. First, we have uh, Maria Line Ola, who is professor of philosophy at the University of San Francisco. Uh, her research intertwines ancient philosophy, continental philosophy, environmental philosophy, and philosophy of medicine. She is co she's the author of Eco-Affectivity, Exploring Pathos and Life's Material Interfaces, and co-editor of Ontologies of Nature, Continental Perspectives, and Environmental Reorientations. She's currently working on a new book manuscript entitled Elemental Loss. Uh, her articles have been published in a range of journals, including Ancient Philosophy, Configuration, uh, environmental philosophy, okay, graduate faculty philosophy journal, radical philosophy review, uh, and research in phenomenology. She's also a member of the executive board of the Pacific Association uh, for the Continental Tradition, otherwise known as PACT. Um, and she's also joined the editorial board of the Journal of Environmental Philosophy as of 2017. Today, she'll be talking about uh, earthquakes, elemental loss, and the search for a new center of gravity. We're also joined by uh, Brian Trainer. Uh, who is Professor of Philosophy and Charles S. Casasa, SJ Chair at Loyola Marymount University. Uh, like Les Murray, um, Brian is, uh, quote, only interested in everything, that's all. Uh, consequently, his scholarship is interdisciplinary in method and wide ranging in its focus. He is the author or editor of 10 books, including Melancholic Joy, Philosophy in the American West, Implotting Virtue and Interpreting Nature. His journey to academia was long and atypical, dropping out of his undergraduate studies to move to Japan, a long stint living in a car, a two-door Mazda 323 hatchback, and working as a climbing guide, uh, including years of living frugally and working episodically on a round-the-world ticket. Um, he earned his PhD at Boston College under Richard Kearney, and his most recent bo book, Melancholic Joy, reflects on the human condition and the, our temptation to despair. Today, he'll be talking to us about the social contract and the natural contract. So without further ado, then I shall turn it over to Maria Line, and we look forward to an excellent talk. Thank you, Brennan. Thank you to the RPA for hosting me and Brian for today's talks. I'm really excited to present, but most of all, of course, excited to listen and also to discuss. With that, I do want to share my PowerPoint to move you through some of the quotes and essential ideas of today's presentation. So I'll share my screen. It is difficult to underestimate the foundational element of the element of earth. It is the element on which we learn to crawl and walk, there where we stand, move, fall, and get up. It is on earth's ground that we farm and find shelter, and it is the element where our bodies ultimately return after their deaths. Beyond the soil on which we stand, we also call the entire planet earth. Thus earth seems to easily escape simple limits and parameters. It is confoundingly complex, as Macaulay has it. Amid the difficulties in containing the wide field of meanings of the term earth, this presentation will carve out space to examine earth through the methodological apparatus laid out in my new book project called Elemental Loss. And it will do so through the concept of the elemental constellation. This methodology furnishes us with a structure to think through earth, both in its particularities, that is the micro level of our engagements, and also the larger forces of earth that connect and divide us which I call the macro level. More specifically, I will use the framework of the elemental constellation to think through our dynamic interactions with the moving earth. That is the disorienting shifts that align with the instability of earthquakes. As I argue, earthquakes are shifts in the elemental that confront us with the broader question of my project, namely the meaning of loss, grief, and mourning beyond that of individualized life. 
thinking through those notions of the various constituents of the elemental constellations, the following question emerges when we focus on earthquakes. Namely, to what degree are the losses we experience in earthquakes natural losses? Are they social losses or a combination of the two? And exactly what is lost as the ground shifts, literally, and we find ourselves tumbling, shaken, and recalibrated? Those questions can be answered, I contend, by unpacking the effective philosophical concept of orientation. For being in the world has always been a question of movement dependent upon our connection to the earth. And if our interactions with the earth have led to increased and changed movements of the earth, um, then how are we or how ought we to be handling the increased instability of the earth and our co-emerging disorientation? If it is the case, that the dizzy man cries the terror of earthquake wherever he goes, feeling that for him all order of the universe is at an end, then it is a task for this presentation to have us confront the dynamics of a world in motion and to grasp our co-emergent search for order and balance. While we often take balance for granted, it is anything but so. Our daily existence of sitting upright and moving toward forward depends on us scanning the horizon and having a sense of what's up and what's down detecting gravity, being able to connect what we see to how we move and knowing where our body is in space, a sense of proprioception. As Carol Sveck puts it, and I quote, each step we take is a miracle of balance as our bodies compensate for hundreds of tiny changes in weight distribution and body position, end quote. Now, similar to the fact that gluteal muscles and pelvic bone transformation allowed earlier hominids a biped traversal of the earth by changing their center of gravity, I argue in this presentation that there are benefits to thinking through the complex challenges lying ahead of us so that we can adjust our own effective embodied apparatus to enable a recalibrated informed center of gravity. As we walk through a world that trembles, the challenge is to transform our embodied sense of disorientation along with the changes in the landscape and not merely to mirror them, but I argue to anticipate the challenges ahead and to make the post human dispositionally adaptable to the changes ahead of us. Since our own orientation tracks elemental qualities, then the co-effective space that is both earth body and stability orientation needs to stand front and center in our deliberations. And thereby I'm following Michel Serre, about whom you'll hear in Brian's presentation. I follow his call, Michel Serre's call to what he calls the, to caress and follow the fissures trembling without losing all senses of orientation. Now I'll structure my account of earth and earthquake by first turning to early Greek cosmologies and ending and discussing both the theory of plate tectonics and its complications. And I'll show that the question of earthquakes is prominent in early accounts and offers thereby a sort of an early glance at abstracting the forces of earth. Still, the early Greeks also confronted with very much a fate-based perspective. And I will argue that such a fate-based perspective actually has returned in our current age in the form of the mythos of the Anthropocene with its doom-based scenario. So notwithstanding natural scientific insights ruling in the background, the dismissal of human agency and communal effort combined with the reliance on determinism has strong similarities with Greek mythos. So well, here I turn to my first account, which focuses on narrating the earth as the origin of stability through Hesiod's perspective. And in the longer version, I also include Homer, but for the sake of time, I'm focusing here on Hesiod. In this first section, I seek to grasp the elemental constellation of earth through, um, through Hesiod. In a world where little is under, under human control, the divine forces associated with both Gaia and Poseidon demonstrate the need to outline order and stability in the world, punctuated by temporary instability in the form of earthquakes. This genealogical account of the meaning of earthquake serves as a first step to grasp what we mean by elemental loss. In Hesiod, earth is portrayed in the form of a deity, Gaia, who is the first to appear after chaos. Gaia, earth, offers the first solid ground away from crevices and ruptures, giving rise to an ordered universe. She is also described as a creative force, giving birth to many other beings and elements, including heaven and sea. 
Hesius Theogony thus presents us with the figure of Earth as ground, as foundation, and as source of fertility. Earth as Gaia is a dynamic entity whose life-creating force stands at the foundation of the Greek cosmos. Hesiod's cosmology also includes other figures that speak to the turbulent side of our world. There, where thunder, fire, storms, and earth shaking occurs. And where Zeus comes to represent thunder and lightning ruling the skies, it's actually Poseidon, whom Hesiod narrates in connection to earthquakes and tsunamis. He is, in the Greek, Gaia Echos, earth holding, and he is booming earth shaker, Epictipos Enosigaios. Overall, what Hesiod's account of Earth and Earth shaking philosophically expresses regarding balance is the following. For the early Greek world, the Earth as foundation provides order to the cosmos. And while other divine forces may temporarily disturb this equilibrium, the question and the meaning of balance is dependent upon the divine world. Mythological access to earthquakes is done through proposing a divine architectonic order with disturbance of balance diagnosed as a divine temporary interruption. Our own embodied orientation to the world is dependent upon this divine framework, thus making the question of human orientation one that co-emerges externally, dependent upon the fate of the world. Now, in the longer version of this project, I also talk about Aristotle and his account of Earth, and uh, I then move on to uh, the se second part of the project, which talks about modernity's take on earthquakes. And for that, I turn to Voltaire and Kant. And here for my presentation, I focus on Voltaire. Voltaire, for Voltaire, the suffering at the heart of the Lisbon earthquake um, stands as a final condemnation on the main standing influential ideas of his time. Versus Leibniz, the Lisbon earthquake demonstrates for Voltaire that the world we live in is definitely not the best possible world as Leibniz had argued. The power of the earthquake prompts Voltaire to see human communities similar to ant heaps, namely easily destroyable, vulnerable congregations that stand at the mercy of larger forces. There is no saving power in God. If anything, he argues, it is the mountains which save us from earthquakes rather than the power of a presumed God. This provokes Voltaire to, to dismiss the world and its actions as simply being the product of an all-knowing and all-powerful being that is God since such a being cannot be squared with provoking such evil events. And here I'm quoting from the poem on the Lisbon disaster. Are you so sure the eternal cause that knows all things and for itself creates could not have placed us in this dairy clime without volcanoes seething beneath our feet, end quote. While some preachers blame the inhabitants of Lisbon for their immoral behaviors, which would then have prompted divine punishment, Voltaire points out the inconsistency of this argument, not only because innocent children have died, but also since supposedly equally morally indulgent cities such as Paris are still dancing, while Lisbon, he says, burns. Life instead, as Voltaire sees it, is a game of chance. However, as much as he acknowledges the inherently violent and contingent character of nature as he sees it, in the end, he also blames humanity for needlessly bringing additional suffering into the world. He argues in one of his letters the following, men do themselves more harm on their little molehill than nature does. More men are slaughtered in the wars of our own creation than are swallowed up by earthquakes. And this is in a letter from 1755. Thus Voltaire's interpretation of the Lisbon earthquake entails the following aspects. A condemnation of the thought that the world as we know it is perfect and completely under the power of an all good and all powerful God. Second of all, the earthquake shows the nature of chance. Thirdly, humans compound suffering through their own fights and conflicts. And finally, whether or not we ought to have hope for a future remains a question mark. Compared to earlier classical accounts of earth and earthquakes, for Voltaire, the Lisbon earthquake shows the irreconcilable nature of suffering and destruction. Voltaire moves the idea of ground away from the divine towards natural irrationality, leaving us without a clear path towards a meaningful future. Hope is contested, indicating that human orientation towards the world and our own future is in doubt. Rather than condemning natural forces in Voltaire's perspective, um, 
humans should take an introspective look at compounding sources for destruction and violence. Voltaire thereby moves the question of external natural violence, that is the earth, towards our own inner human landscape, that is our human disposition towards orientation, directing us towards nihilism and suggesting the need for a clearer, more peaceful compass to orient us. Now onto the third section, which really sort of thinks about the theoretical foundation as we currently have it for thinking about earthquakes and rethinking what that means for our own orientation. Now our current understanding of the earth and its dynamics is to a large extent informed by research done by the earth sciences in the 20th century, and particularly the theory called plate tectonics, which is the idea that continents embedded in plates are constantly moving at a rate of about one to four inches a year. Earthquakes are but one manifestation of forms of change happening in the earth. And others may include mountains rising and eroding, oceans expanding and shrinking, and volcanoes erupting. The overall picture, therefore, that has been developing is that of the Earth's surface as being in a constant state of change. And the theory of plate tectonics thereby is centered around the idea that the Earth's solid upper crust, the lithosphere, is separated into plates that move over the asthenosphere, which is the molten upper portion of the mantle. Oceanic and continental plates come together, spread apart, and interact at boundaries all over the planet. It's thus where pl plate boundaries meet, where they meet or divide, that we find most geological activities, such as earthquakes. And those boundaries can either move towards each other, convergent, can move away from each other when they are divergent, or they can move sideways, which is being addressed as being transforming. Now, I want to argue that the Global North has acted locally in conformity with the knowledge provided by those 20th century Earth sciences and the theory of plate tectonics, and thereby um, sort of has moved forward. However, our current engagement with earthquake dynamics also shows three important uh, shortcomings, namely failures of social justice, that is tendencies to close our eyes off for dysfunctional building regimes in states and countries left in shambles in the wake of colonization. So the global earth locally interacts with the earth according to this theory, but fails to close its eye for whatever damage it is doing or has done to the global south. Second of all, failures to grasp the gravity of the effects of climate change in the form of increased frequency of earthquakes. And I'll say a little bit more about that in what's uh, coming up. And thirdly of all, failures to anticipate and reckon with the broader physical and social problems following the discovery and implementation of techniques such as fracking, which create multiple problems in terms of quaking. Now, in what will follow, I will focus mostly of all on the increased frequency of earthquakes in the age of climate change, thereby talking about how um, earthquakes are being provoked through our interaction with the planet. And much of what I'm saying here is informed by uh, this fantastic book by Bill McGuire called Waking the Giant. An important point complicating plate tectonics is the failure to grasp the gravity of the effects of climate change in the form of the increased frequency of earthquakes. That's especially true if we follow the reasoning as we have it in Waking the Giant. McGuire analyzes the temperature increases at the end of the last ice age and concludes that it caused many changes, including geological hazards such as earthquakes. Similarly, he warns over time, can the temperature changes associated with current climate change not only bring about drought, floods, etc., but also landslides and earthquakes comparable to the changes that took place after the last ice age. It's only with a little nudge, he argues, that the sleeping giant, that is the broadly benign Earth, can be awakened. Small climactic changes could set off much larger changes in the Earth's surface, such as earthquakes. Now, the scientific mechanism that he and others point to is a process called isostatic uplift, whereby the process of the Earth lifting up uh, happens due to less pressure on it. As climate change causes glaciers and large ice sheets to melt, the crust of the Earth experiences less pressure and thus experiences an uplift. It bounces back. Thus, humans, 
through their own competitive wars and obsessions with fossil fuels have compounded the causes and effects of shifting grounds, with, which added uh, in certain places larger pressures while other pressures are lifted but still through their uplift, wake up the giant earth beneath our feet. That leads to the following question, how may we find a new sense of orientation? And here I'm moving towards my conclusion. If we should seek following Ser, a new language to address the material, physical and social cultural aspects of earthquakes in our lives. And as we seek to find a new balance engaging with the earth dynamic forces, then our vocabulary needs to approximate this material physical world more closely. As we think about such a new vocabulary, we might need adjustment to our own sense of embodied orientation. Similar to responses and shifts to the elemental constellation of fire, our response has predominantly been so far in a register of the legalistic economic. When earthquakes happen, Homes are damaged, insurance claims are felt, etc. However, I'm arguing that we need a broader imagination in terms of rethinking our interaction with the earth. What I propose is a renewed attention for an ethics of balance, an ethics that seeks our and sees our existence as emerging along the lines of an earthly dynamic flux, one that nonetheless tries to gain equilibrium in adjusting to external and in internal movements of shaking. It is Aristotle who proposed such ethics on a personal level. For instance, in the, in the Nicomachean Ethics, he talks about seeking balance and responding to the needs of a dynamic contingent world. Translating this out from his personal virtue ethics to a wider world in need of ethical balance, his ideas can provide, I think, traction to the idea of finding balance in a changing world, while at the same time abandoning the idea that this is up to each individual instead postulating that seeking balance these days is a communal act. Now I have two images here, which is the tightrope walker and also finally um, the garden of exile in the Jewish Museum of Berlin, um, which is an, um, a building developed by Daniel Liebeskind, which both indicate that the sense of finding equilibrium needs to take place both on the individual level here as on the tightrope walker existence as well as rethinking through the social engagement with forces of disorientation. So with that, I end my presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Maria Line. Yeah. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead then and, and turn it over to Brian. Uh, Brian, if you want to take it away, and then that'll set the stage for our discussion to come. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, like Maria Line, I'd like to thank Brendan and uh, the RPA for this. And uh, it's great as always to present with Maria Line, who's a good friend and who's, uh, whose work is always inspiring to me. I think that there'll be a lot of uh, overlaps at the end of our two essays. <clears throat> so on June 1st, 2019, Michel Serre died in Paris. He left behind many decades of influential work, books, essays, interviews, lectures, podcasts, and more. However, in general, Serre has been sorely neglected by Anglophone philosophers. There are, I think, a lot of reasons for this. First, there's the sheer size of his body of work. There's at least 73 books on my account. Second, much of this work has until very recently been untranslated, although that's being uh, rectified. But perhaps most problematically, Serre stood outside of philosophical camps or traditions as they're commonly understood. Although he was incredibly well-read, not only in philosophy, but also in literature, science, politics, and more, he was in some meaningful sense, a tradition of one. For philosophers trained as narrow specialists or those who participate even fruitfully in kind of insider debates, it's hard to know how to engage Serre in his work. Is he an epistemologist, a philosophical anthropologist, a philosopher of language, an empiricist, a philosopher of science, a commentator on technology? The difficult truth is that Serre was all of these and more. I've written elsewhere about the contributions I believe his thinking can make to hermeneutics, which is one of my areas of focus. <clears throat> Today, however, I wanna focus on Sarah as an important, strikingly original, and indeed prescient environmental thinker. <clears throat> this aspect of Sarah's thinking is on display in a range of works, including The Natural Contract, Home in Essence, uh, Le Mal Propre, Habité, and Biogie, uh, 
several of which are soon to be available in English, or some, at this point, a number of these have been translated. Uh, here, however, I wanna take up The Natural Contract, which is a work he produced uh, early in the last, or not early in the beginning of this uh, millennium, early in the last millennium, and was translated into English in 1995. Sarah argues that it, time has come for us to come to terms with the ways in which humanity, taken as a collective, is interacting with nature viewed globally. And those two qualifications are important. Among several remarkable things about this work is the degree to which it anticipates our contemporary concern with the Anthropocene in both scholarly and popular literature. While the idea behind the Anthropocene pops up in informal and preliminary ways uh, earlier than this, it was originally brought into its current usage only around the year 2000 by Paul Crutzen and others, and it's only become widely recognized in perhaps the last decade. Viewed in this light, Sayre's work seems farsighted indeed. Bill McKibben's The End of Nature was published in 1989, just a year earlier than The National Contract in French. And in some sense, Sayre's must be seen as a philosophical first responder in recognizing the environmental crisis as a truly global phenomenon, which is what I want to talk about today. As Baird Callicott writes, quote, just as Nace, Rootley, Ralston, and I, that is Callicott, are widely acknowledged to be the founders of environmental ethics, Sayre and Jameson should be widely acknowledged to be the founders of climate ethics. That is of something like, uh, that's the end of the quotation, and I'm adding, that is of something like the ethics of the Anthropocene, insofar as climate change is arguably the marker par excellence of the Anthropocene. Sayre begins his account in The Natural Contract with a reflection on Goya's painting, Fight with Cudgels. Duelo a Garatazo. One of Goya's so-called black paintings, which he painted directly on the walls of his home in the early 1820s, it depicts two men armed with sticks fighting beneath a patchy sky in a dim green gray countryside. It's a familiar scene in both history and in fiction. Two men bludgeoning each other over some seemingly insolvable disagreement, whether land or money or kin. Both appear disheveled with exertion and blood courses down the cheek of one combatant, perhaps the mark of a blow that began the struggle. But what seems unusual and which has elicited attention from interpreters is that both men appear to be immersed in mud up to their knees. Now it's not clear if this was on the original painting or if it's an effect of them being removed from the walls, uh, but nevertheless, that's how the painting appears to us today. The duelo sets Sayers to wondering about the nature of violence, a concern one can hear, though in a different key, in much of his work. Here, however, his interest is not so much in how the violence begins, but in how it is controlled. There's a long philosophical tradition expressed most clearly in Hobbes, Rousseau, and Locke that holds that human conflict is constrained and regulated by a social contract. In a Hobbesian state of nature, our experience would be of violence unconstrained, every man for himself, the war of all against all. Such a life would be famously solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Consequently, people come together and sign an agreement, metaphorically, in which they give up certain rights or freedoms in exchange for the assurance and protection of other rights. Under the social contracts, violence becomes regulated. Some forms of violence are sanctioned in certain instances, but much violence becomes prohibited and punishable. When violence is permitted, it takes place according to rules prescribing its objects and its aims. Even in war, for all its barbarity and moral hazard, there's operations according to rules of a sort, distinguishing friend from enemy and even legislating the conduct of the combatants. So at the most basic level, war distinguishes between ally and enemy. Even the unhinged soldier perpetrating a war crime is not, in most instances, in danger of turning with similar evil on his brothers in arms. Under the social contract, we've escaped the state of war against all, and, uh, sorry, the war of all against all for a state of controlled violence, quote, some against some, or only in some cases. That of course does not make war good, it simply makes it less worse than a certain alternative. Ultimately, the goal is not to rest easy having escaped unconstrained savagery for at least a somewhat more restrained state of war, but having done so to take a further step from war towards peace. Okay, well and good, 
but the image of the social contract is fundamentally incomplete. When we think of conflict, we think of the two combatants, Achilles and Hector, Napoleon and Wellington, the second battalion of the fifth Marine Regiment and the opposing German forces. But what we forget, ironically, I think, given the language of the state of nature in Hobbes, is that every battle takes place in a place, on terrain, in an environment, which is itself also involved in the conflict. In the above instances, the ringing plains of windy Troy, the gently rolling hillocks of Waterloo, or the farms and copses of trees in the Marne Valley in the Bellow Wood. Indeed, it's telling that prior to the advent of in environmental history, which is a relatively uh, new part of, of the study of history, prior to the advent of environmental history, even quite detailed accounts of these battles are incredibly sparse in terms of detailed environmental description that's unrelated to the tactical advantage or disadvantage for combat. It's as if conflict takes place in some abstract or theoretical space. As a consequence, we forget that the earth itself is the always present environs in which our conflicts unfold. Goya's duelists beat each other senseless, each one fixed on avoiding the blows of his enemy and seeking to deliver the decisive blow himself, all the while oblivious to the fact that their struggle is churning up and destroying the very land in which they battle for dominance. And that as a consequence, they themselves are slowly sinking into the quagmire produced by their own furious thrashing, being pulled down together. For Serre, this painting is a distilled image of human conflict, whether the violence is physical, economic, or social, and it reveals something essential. The earth is, in effect, the third party of all our conflicts, not the stage or the backdrop for human conflict, but a participant in it often a victim of it. The role of the earth in conflict has understandably gone unnoticed for much of human history. This is not to say that the damage done to the earth was insignificant, far from it. It's merely to say that for the vast majority of human history, the role of the earth in human conflict was not ultimately determinative. It could affect the conflict between the combatants, as when Wellington used the reverse slope of the ridge at Waterloo to conceal his forces from Napoleon. It could directly shape the course of battle as when General Winter helped to eject Napoleon from Russia. The destruction of terrain or ecosystems could harm local people through loss of crops or livelihood, and no doubt the loss of particular local sites was a tragedy to the people who loved them. And finally, of course, from a more enlightened and non-anthropocentric perspective, the destruction of terrain and ecosystems were harms in themselves. All this is true. However, Recently, something has changed, and the Earth, long a factor, even an agent in human conflict, and almost always a victim of the same, is now, as it were, fighting back. So we're on to part three now, from the local to the global. What precisely has changed here? As with many things today, we can find the answer by considering the scale of the issue. The social contract makes the most sense and is most effective when viewed on a human scale. However, this view, this scale of things, has been under pressure for some time. Indeed, there's good reason to think that this was a serious problem, even at the scale of the nation state used by the great philosophers of the social contract. In any case, many of the problems we face today, and certainly all of the distinctive problems of the Anthropocene, dwarf the human scale in both spatial and temporal senses. The, the geological scale that Marjolein was referring to is indicative of this. However it might apply, for example, to Rousseau's France or Hobbes's England, the social contract works best in smaller communities in which the tragedy of the commons, free ridership, and similar problems are more easily addressed. As such communities grow, the social contract requires bureaucracy and institutions to function. And as it grows further, even those buttresses of the edifice become strained. Today, however, we've reached a scale that's going to require a rewriting of the contract itself. And this is the, the argument that Sarah makes. Rather than tinkering with the implementation of the social contract, we, we're, a new contract is necessary. The social contract is something we've generally thought of about in terms of relatively distinct groups. For example, the citizens of the village of Amblesay, or the, uh, the city of Leeds, or the country of England, existing in relatively distinct places, the Lake District, Great Britain, 
Northern Europe. So the, the people are local and distinct, and so is the environment. In such a context, conflict and violence were phenomena that had only local effects. Particular groups perpetrated violence and particular groups suffered from it. And when nature was harmed, it was harmed in a local way. But humanity, humans taken as a group, are now a global power. We can debate about the date of this metamorphosis or metastasis, but the consequence is no longer in dispute. When we think about violence, we must, at least in certain instances, think about the relationship of humanity taken as a collective, taken as a whole, to nature taken as a whole. So what will this mean for the social contract? And this is moving on to the final section. Sayre's work suggests that our conception of the social contract is deficient in at least two senses. First, it's ill-equipped to account for global relationships. Traditionally, no one thought of the social contract as a contract among all humans, only as a contract between, for example, citizens of the United States or Californians or some other subset of humanity. Second, the social contract exists between people. More than human nature does not factor into it. And even if we were to include more than human nature, the first deficiency suggests that we would generally think of it in equally local and limited terms. The grazing commons of the Sierra Nevada foothills, the water quality of the Ganges, the biodiversity of the Columbia River watershed. Thus, the social contract fails both in terms of its membership and in terms of its scope. What we need today is a new contract. Quoting from Serre, back to nature then. That means that we must add to the exclusively social contract of symbiosis and reciprocity in which our relationship to things would set aside mastery and possession in favor of admiring attention, reciprocity, contemplation, and respect, where knowledge would no longer imply property nor action mastery, nor would property and mastery imply their excremental results and origins. Sarah's referring here to two other books he wrote. One is uh, The Parasite and the other is Malfeasance. An armistice contract in the objective war, a contract of symbiosis, for a symbiont recognizes the host rights where a parasite, which is what we are now, condemns to death the one he pillages and inhabits, not realizing that in the long run, he's condemning himself to death too. We've reached an inflection point, crossed a threshold. We are casting off from one world in which the effects of human conflicts are local to another in which those effects are global. Again, quoting Serre, the term contract originally means the tract or trait or draft that tightens and pulls, a set of cords that assures without language the subtle system of constraints and freedoms through which each is linked, I'm sorry, through which each linked element receives information about every other and about the system and draws security from them all, end quote. And so we should recognize that every instance of casting off, of changing the cords of relationship, every instance of casting off from one world to another requires that cords be unfastened and refastened. The ship is unmoored from the dock before taking to sea. The climbers leaving the safety of the hut or the bivouac rope up before crossing the glacier. Playing with the same image, Sarah writes, when climbing, if the, might, if the mountain turns out to be difficult, appallingly tough, then the contract, that is the cord, the rope, itself takes on a different function. It no longer binds just the mountaineers among themselves, that is a social contract between humans, but in addition anchors itself to the rock face at specific strong points. A natural contract joins the social contract. I'm a climber and I love this image in particular. If you're crossing a glacier often, two climbers will be roped up to each other so that if one falls into a crevasse, the other can arrest the fall. But as you get onto steeper and steeper terrain, the rope still connects the two climbers, but it's also anchored to points in the rock to arrest them if they fall. Although Sayre himself does not make the point, I want to emphasize that reflecting on a natural contract is going to force us to rethink the social contract precisely because today a single cord or contract links us to other people and to the natural world, this final image of climbers on a steep slope. The social contract is signed by individuals who in so doing leave the state of nature and form society. 
But the natural contract, at least the one we need, is signed by a group, that is by humanity itself, and nature, that is what Michel Serre calls hard reality. The signatories of the social contract are individual humans. The signatories of the natural contract are more than human nature and humanity itself, all of humanity, in the Anthropocene at least. In the age of global humanity affecting global nature, the natural contract presupposes an expanded and expansive social contract. And the prospects for the natural contract are dependent on the health of the social contract. Here, I think I'll connect to the end of Marjolein's paper. We cannot simply add the natural world to a dysfunctional social contract and assume it's going to work. To use only the most obvious example, there will be no solution to climate change rooted in preserving existing social injustices. There is no possible solution in which we simply freeze existing emissions or in which everyone cuts back with some equal percentage and in so doing, we lock in the affluence of the United States and Western Europe and lock in the poverty of parts of Africa, Western China, and South Asia. Very understandably, the people in those parts of the world are not going to sign a contract predicated on locking in their poverty. Uh, this seems to me to be one of the terrible lessons of the, the COVID uh, pandemic. The response to COVID-19 was a dry run, a test that we failed for international cooperation. Rich countries have tried to save themselves while leaving poor countries to fend for themselves with respect to vaccines. But neither in the case of the pandemic nor in the case of climate change can individual countries save themselves. We are going to sign the contract collectively and save ourselves collectively, or we're going to go down together. Sarah is correct in saying that we need a natural contract one that would include the more than human world as well as people. But in redrafting the contract to include new signatories, their concerns are going to require a redrafting of the contract to better reflect the rights and concerns of existing human signatories. We cannot navigate our new relationship to nature without reimagining new ways of being with each other within nature. Now I've got just about two minutes left and I wanna sieve give a quick gesture towards what might guide us in writing that new contract. Sarah makes a gesture towards guiding principles for this new natural contract, which is framed, he said, by two double laws. Here he's playing on uh, Matthew chapter 22, in which Christ, asked to name the greatest commandment, singular, responds with a kind of double law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, this is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Sayre's contract endorses something very like this, right? It's a single law that he breaks into two components. One, love one another. This is our first law. For 2,000 years, this is the only one that has been able to help us avoid, for at least a few moments, hell on earth. This contractual obligation is divided into 1A, a local law, asking us to love our neighbors, and 1b, a global law requiring us to love at least humanity if we do not believe in God. So local and universal. It's impossible to, to separate these two precepts under the penalty of hatred. But then Sarah adds, so that was 1a and 1b. Two, here then is the second law, which asks us to love the world. This contractual obligation is divided into 2A, the old local law that attaches us to the ground where our ancestors lie or where we live, and 2B, the new global law that no legislator, as far as I know, has yet written, which requires of us the universal love of the physical earth. It is impossible to separate these two precepts under the penalty of hatred. So here, Sarah unites four laws four loves into a single contract or cord connecting all the diverse beings of the world. We cannot, we cannot separate love of this individual person from love of humanity, nor can we separate love of this particular plot of earth, lowercase e, from our love of earth, uppercase e. And in uniting these laws, 
we must recognize that we cannot separate love of other humans, that is the social contract, from love of the earth, that is the natural contract. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I'm not yet seeing um, comments on Facebook, so I will kind of right. proceed forth with my own questions and we'll see what we come up with sure. uh, from our viewers. Um, so I, I, Maria Lynn, I wanted to start with you. And in fact, in both cases, I think um, the questions are gonna be sort of anchored in our very recent experience with the pandemic to start. Um, and so, you know, there's this kind of interplay between orientation and disorientation. And it reminded me a little bit of the question of normality as we confronted it uh, through the period of lockdown. And there, what we frequently saw, and I think rightly, at least to my mind, was sort of a critique of the idea of return to normal, as in the uh, previous, if you, another way of saying it might be the previous orientation was already mm -hmm. uh, a, a misorientation. Um, and so I, I guess, to kind of come back to this question of finding our balance. Um, if you could kind of talk about that that project of orientation and balance finding and, and how it kind of corresponds to um, conditions that are pre-existing and taken as static, uh, which themselves we might want to overturn or see disrupted through some quakes. Um, so yeah, maybe that, I hope that makes sense and, and is food for thought and something you can respond to. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I mean, in, in many ways, the project on elemental loss, um, you know, also speaks to the changes that um, were uncovered in the, in the pandemic insofar as it shows that many forms of loss aren't just abrupt losses, but that have been brought about incrementally over time very slowly and I think became very much visible during the pandemic. Um, and much like the pandemic, I think many of the changes that have been brought about in the natural world that we now altogether diagnose as climate change have been brought about in a kind of similar, uh, very slow but steady demand, but in such a way that we suddenly now are looking at the world and are experiencing a sense of loss and disorientation. Now, I think that, you know, I'm not uh, naive to think that we ought or need to return to previous conditions. I think we've always, as humans, have adjusted our balance. And my uh, earlier invocation of hominids and their changing their centers of gravity as they came to become biped indicates that the case of human orientation has always been a question of effective and embodied uh, readjustment of our own centers of gravity. So as I'm thinking about the future, I want to defy the fact that the myth of the Anthropocene is our fate so that we can evolve beyond that myth, which kind of gets us stuck in, in a divine orientation as we can kind of see uh, in the early Greeks and to say, well, there are ways by way of which following Sarah, we can think about a new contract where we can think about a new kind of language, but it does evolve, it does involve finding a new and ever evolving center of gravity, whereby which we move along this in the, the changes and fluxes in the world, but at the same time also are no longer as we diminish maybe the, the shaking of the world and thereby increase the disorientation for the future. So that's kind of my, so yeah, I, I, I do agree. I don't want to be naive uh, at all, but at the same time, I do think we are living in a time of disorientation and that we would do well to diminish some of that disorientation by evolving towards what I call a new effective equilibrium. Yeah. Could I follow up on that? Yeah, please do. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, I love this part of your project, Marjolein, and I wonder if you could just say one more word following up that same line of thought about as we're coming to this new sense of balance, there's sort of two ways that can happen. One is we can sort of decrease the disruption that we're dealing with, so to speak. And with respect to the Anthropocene, that would be you know trying to slow down climate change, the worst of the damage, something like that. But another way 
um, another way to do it is sort of become better at balancing ourselves, right? So, um, yeah, so I wonder, so a two part question. One is, is in your project of elemental loss, in, to, what, to what degree are you, you yourself balancing out like our need to sort of ameliorate the damages of climate change and things like that, and our need, our need to sort of just become more flexible and responsive ourselves. I, as I'm sure you know, and as, as listeners uh, are probably hearing, uh, Marjolaine and I are both talking about Michel Serre. It's not the only figure either one of us works with, but we both uh, have been reading him of late. And he's got a, a whole concept in the Troubadour of Knowledge where he talks about unstable equilibrium, that even in equilibrium, there's always this sort of, uh, it's never static. There's always movement going on in micro adjustments. So even if we reduce or somehow ameliorate the damage we're doing to the natural world, yeah, times change, hominids evolve, we're still gonna be making adjustments. So anyway, your thoughts on sort of if balance is what this chapter on the earth is working up to in elemental loss, how much of that balance is reducing the tremors, so to speak, with earthquakes, and how much of it is learning to ride them out like a surfer on a wave or something? Yeah, I mean, um, I think the images at the end kind of indicate that, that it, is, it is both. That, that, I, that I, for hope, to, to, to paint a picture of where you know, the, the, the way the giant is not awoken too much so that we reduce our impact. But at the same time, um, as the tightrope walker image indicates, you know, sort of thinking through Nietzsche's idea of living dangerously, but at the same time, um, precariously moving along. I do think that there is the task there to become better at balancing ourselves. But I wanted to follow up. I'm not happy with the tightrope walker. And that's why I inserted the Liebeskind image because this is not just a private individual project, yeah. I believe. I think Liebeskind in, in sort of giving us sort of an, an image of disorientation with a slanted floor in that museum, he's giving us sort of a message about what happens when a whole people has to emigrate and, and kind of has us feel what disorientation might have been for others. And I think um, it is that communal sense of, of trying to live ourselves into these disorientations that can allow us to become a little bit more accommodating towards not making other people disoriented because that's what the global north is doing towards large, vast other parts of the world. And thereby also can try to think about a much more um, equilibrium lifestyle. I don't know what that means. I don't yeah. know what that means, but um, um, it's, it definitely um, has to follow the outlines of a of, of a constellation rather than just individual people. Yeah, no, I like I love that bit. I, and I wasn't asking you to sort of solve the thing for me, but <laughs> but I think it's it's an important contribution of yours here to think about the social component of this kind of balance or equilibrium. Right. Yeah. And I think Sarah is doing, you know, just wonderful work there in Biogea, for instance, and other work as well, trying to say that the natural disasters, as we call them natural, are in fact very much social disasters. As he compares the Loma Prieta earthquake to the right. Haiti earthquake and says, well, who is to blame here? Surely, like Voltaire, uh, he's very, you know, he, he, he doesn't like the modernity, but modernity was actually on his side because they said very similarly, listen, it's humanity to blame for yeah. those great sources of suffering and not just nature. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah. So um, there's a lot to follow up on. I'm getting some, some good stuff on Facebook here. So I think um, I also want to indicate we're about five minutes out. Would you all mind if we extend by just to maybe five to 10? Is that sure. okay? You have your time for that. Um, that way we can get a couple of these questions. And I think Great. they're important questions. Um, one question, and I think it's a significant question, um, has to do with the issue of sovereignty and enforcement of a social contract, if there is such a thing, and if that's how we're uh, thinking in the terms uh, you're putting forward here, Brian. Um, so who would or could enforce uh, such a, a social contract? I, I think that's the, the, the question. And I, there's, yeah. I, I should say, there's, there's presently to my, I, um, a really, I, I think a really good uh, text, um, Climate Leviathan, 
kind of, you mentioned we, we can't go forward uh, in this fashion, but I think there's a worry that people, that, you know, perhaps um, particular states might, might sort of insert themselves as the ultimate deciders on some of these issues. So we could end up with a kind of global climate fascism. Uh, so anyway, I'll put that out to you and yeah, I'll just respond quickly so we can get other people in. I, I was unaware of this book, Climate Leviathan, but I'll check it out. So, uh, yeah, I mean, like my question to Mario, and there's no easy answer for who's going to um, help to enforce a sort of global social contract. It's the same sort of difficulty we have with every other international and, and global regime. Uh, you know, the United Nations is a, is, imperfect is a radical understatement, is a, an imperfect institution. Um, but it's also true that we've, we do have international agreements that have worked partially imperfectly. Um, and we're gonna have to do that. I mean, if we get a, a global regime having to do with greenhouse gases the same way we did for uh, CFCs that were putting a hole in the ozone layer, uh, we'll be able to address it, even if there are some people who defect or free ride, if it's a small enough number of them. If the United States defects or free rides or China or Brazil or Russia, that, that won't work. Um, but th there's never going to be a contract of any size that there won't be some people breaking the contract and, and punishments needed. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say about that is, um, I think you're right, Brendan, that at a certain point, this is, this is the real terror of something like climate change. At a certain point, nations will act individually, whether that's sort of a sort of global fascism trying to enforce their will on everyone else, or you know, at a certain point, individual countries are gonna start geoengineering without, without asking other people, without any agreements, because they're gonna say, well, we're not getting enough rain. So, so I, I think we need to avoid that at all costs because at a certain point, the kind of climate disasters Mario Line's talking about and climate refugees will be bad enough that people will stop trying to play democracy and they will start trying to play authoritarianism. And so that's a, I think that's a real concern. It's why we have to try and do as best we can as quickly as we can. Absolutely. We've actually, interestingly, we've had arguments, I should say here, um, one of our first few episodes um, was, uh, Kind of bringing forward the the idea that um, you know a kind of uh, left political ecology should assert you know um, some level of of sovereign control over at the global level. I mean, it's of course the that's easier said than done by right. <laughs> by by a long shot. Um, okay, yeah. Um, so I think there's another kind of question here um, uh, that is related, and it it called called me to an, a number of uh, questions. One is, um, it, well, I'll I'll say it as they've written it, and then I'll I'll uh, let you respond. It's how does the Earth sign on to such a contract? And they frame this in terms of the idea of even uh, you know even within social contract theory, we see the question of tacit consent. Um, so when did I sign on, they ask. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, hurricanes and other phenomena don't necessarily have uh, any particular affective relation to me. Um, so I guess that's maybe for, for both of you to sort of, uh, what is your thought on this? And I guess, you know, central to it, I mean, you mentioned the possibility of the earth as agent, but even if that's the case, does the earth have the capacity for consent? And does consent, what role does consent play in the kind of contract we're discussing here? Yeah, nice. Uh, do you want to say anything about that, Marjolaine? I don't want to jump in too precipitously. Um, yeah, I think most of this question is, is aimed at you, but I do think by that, um, and that's why I like Sarah, is that um, we do not need to think about saying and think and, and language only in terms of human language, right? So there are certain kinds of ways in which Earth speaks or addresses us just by its expressions. And I think science, especially tectonic plate science, has done a very kind of nice job of translating what it is that something like Earth says to us, right? So 
I do think, and Sarah's really keen on this, that we need to find different ways of accessing what some of these natural entities on, in the ontological realm are telling us without speaking in, in human language. So Deva, I would want to defy this question about consent um, in the human language, because I think it, it, it overlooks this very important thing that Sarah is addressing, namely that we look at a realm of semantics that lies uh, beyond that of the human discourse. So, and, and there, I think, as I'm talking about an ethics of balance, I do think, right, we can see more through um, studies, we can actually see the effects of climate change on increased shaking in the world. There's much more ruptures happening, for instance, in Alaska that have been uh, associated with these ice sheath, uh, ice sheet thinning. So there's definitely ways that we can talk about the earth addressing us in this kind of way, if it, if only through these scientific realms. If anything, right, we need to do a better job of translating those scientific insights so that ethical action can be taken. And I think that's where the culprit ultimately lies, not in science, but in our own ways of translating those scientific reports to, to then connect uh, to the broader realm of ethics and politics. Okay, those were my two cents, but I think <laughs> <laughs> I I endorse those two cents, as you know, Marjolein. Uh Marjolein and I wrote a paper together in which we talked about some of what she said here in terms of ex the expressive content of the more than human world. So I'll say something about agency and consent in a minute, but but I would um, I I mean I'm not even sure exactly uh, where this. Um, it, it, it's it's hard to get a question through Facebook and then the mediation of Zoom. So I'm not saying I'm contesting what the, the questioner asked, but I do think that the earth does speak to us metaphorically in certain ways and that we can hear it and that we can translate it into human terms imperfectly to be sure. But that's also the case when someone speaks French to me, I've got kind of like an intermediate, advanced intermediate level of French and I translate it. The problem of translation is a very interesting hermeneutic problem, but the, the impossibility of perfect translation, as Paul Ricoeur tells us, doesn't belie the fact that translation happens all the time, constantly. So we can translate the things the earth is telling us in the scientific realm, as, as Marjolein has pointed out. I would also say that, that the lived experience of, of people on the land, um, we can, we can learn a lot from indigenous groups in this regard or from non-indigenous groups who have been living a very long time in an area and, and sort of learned to listen to what the earth says there, the rhythms and the patterns in it. Um, so I think we can learn to hear what the earth is saying. And then we can try to be um, responsible representatives of it in terms of signing the contract, the same way we might do with very young people whose rights are protected as part of a social contract or people who get, cannot sign because they're incapacitated in some way. Um, there's a bunch of interesting legal work being done on whether or not um, um, more than human nature or even abiotic entities like a mountain can have standing in, in courts. And just like uh, a, a incapacitated person might need someone to represent them in court to give them standing in a lawsuit, the same thing can happen with a river or a forest or a tree. So um, I, I don't mean that to gloss over the complexity and the importance of the question that came through Facebook. Consents of, even with two rational people, like when I go to my doctor and they're doing tests, right? The informed consent is a lot more complicated than just saying, do you consent? It's, it's a complicated sort of issue. But I do think the sorts of things Marjolein has said can, can make meaningful headway in that direction. So, um, if we, yeah, we still have a couple minutes, I think, given that extension. So I, I, maybe I'll, I'll pose a couple of uh, related questions. Um, Marjolein, to you, um, you know, this issue of scale was mentioned in uh, Brian's talk, and I know you've talked about collectivity. Um, and, you know, I, I, I guess in, in, in terms of this ethics of balance, the fig and, and, and I don't mean to sort of be overly attentive to the image necessarily that you've chosen that, of the tightrope walker, which I know you've already mentioned the inadequacies of that. Um, 
but you know, I guess the question is a question of to what extent, how do we scale up that concept of balance to the collectivity? And it, you know, if, if the, the other side of that relation is um, nature as a whole or the earth as a whole, um, does that scale alter our sense of what that ethics um, looks like? You mentioned Aristotle, um, but you know, I mean, Aristotle is very clearly working in a very small context and and vis-a-vis -vis, um, a relatively small class of society who he would consider his equals and that the kind of reciprocity um, that comes with that relation. So. I would just like to hear you kind of say kind of how that those two questions of scale and collectivity uh, impact our understanding of what you mean by an ethics of balance. Yeah, it, it's very interesting. I, I am continuing to sort of, you know, to, to think through those lines of argumentation. And I have really benefited from thinking through both sort of models of scale or anarchism as well as to think through models of collective action and trust and reciprocity as postulated by the economist Eleanor Ostrom, insofar as these are kind of models of collectively working from the bottom up, uh, postulating sort of trust between pe people rather than imposed from above or individuated privately, but sort of collectively. And of course, my question is, how far can you push those models, right? They, they might work well in certain kinds of local environments, as um, Brian has postulated. Um, but, but how far can you push them towards the scale that I am arguing for? And um, I don't know. I have to think about it. But I think it's worthwhile to kind of think beyond sort of global authoritarian versus private individualization and, and certain kinds of businesses taking off to, to think through intermediate, more interesting and collaborative models. So that's exactly where I'm also wanting to locate that search for orientation. Namely, I think, I mean, that's that's where the tightrope walker is definitely not. Um, the tightrope walker is, I think, excellent in thinking through danger. That's why I like that image. That's why I think that, you know, that this does a nice job, but it doesn't, it doesn't do the job of collectively holding each other as we're trying to narrow the depths of falling and as we're trying to kind of think through how we can actually reorient ourselves effectively. And I think one of one of the moments I've been thinking about, and, and Brian knows this, the effective moment is, is trust. I think with trust, we can come to reorient ourselves, but uh, but trust needs to be built. So this is this is incrementally over time. A, a long response to, to a really good question that I'm still struggling with. Thank you, uh, and thank you for those who asked it. Yeah, I would say that's super helpful for the question I was asked earlier too about the, the contract too, Marjolaine. I think trust is going to be a really important thing to think through for both of us. Um, yeah, and the only other thing your comment reminded me of is that, yeah, El Eleanor Ostrom's work shows that the tragedy of the commons is not unavoidable, right? That there mm -hmm. are societies. Yeah. And so back to Marjolein's point about this, this, uh, this level, this, this sphere in between the individual and the global is this sort of societies of different sizes. There are societies, Ostrom shows us, that don't fall prey to the tragedy of the commons for generation after generation. The real question, so it's not a question of whether we can scale it to the individual or the social. We have lots of examples of that happening. The question is whether we can scale it from the social to the global. And that's, that's the big question as uh, the person asked on Facebook in terms of a global regime. Th those are hard questions. And you know, I, I'm, I, I suspect we may find that 7.5 billion people are hard to get into agreement, whether it's for a social contract or for a regime of balance. But, but we can do it in some scale that's significantly larger than the individual. That seems undeniable. I think you're right. So unfortunately it's 510 and <laughs> we are the radical philosophy hour. So I feel like we have to stop. I should say if it was up to me, I'd probably just have this conversation with the two of you for the rest of the evening, but I know you have lives to get to as well. I, I will say it was incredibly enlightening and enjoyable, and I very much enjoyed the conversation. I think uh, the folks on Facebook have as well. So thank you all so much. Uh, and everybody who didn't get to make it, this will be available on YouTube, so you can check there as well.
All right. Thanks so much, y'all. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brandon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Brian.